47. How to pray. Part 19. Prayer and the Word of God. July the 24th, 1956. Good morning, friends. There is no better guide to prayer than the Bible itself, and our communion with God thrives in proportion to our readiness to hear His Word. In the book of Psalms, particularly, we find the prayers of saints to give us a vivid account of actual prayer, as witness Psalm 62. Truly, my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be. And as a tottering fence, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Salah, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Salah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once; twice have I heard this. That power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Psalm sixty-two one to twelve. This psalm was obviously written at a time of crisis, probably during the revolt of Absalom. David emphatically eliminates as any source of possible help either the common people of the nation or its leaders. He was certain that there was no hope in either; both were altogether lighter than vanity. This distrust was well founded. He knew other people because he first of all knew himself. David knew the extent of his own sin, his own waywardness and rebelliousness. More than that, he knew that the issue was in God's hands. He cannot find words sufficiently strong to express the absolute security and the unalterable and unchanging strength of the Almighty, who is His salvation. Thrice he uses the word "only" to assert that God alone is His hope, while the only hope and consultation of His enemies is their self-will. In this, he takes courage. David clearly placed no confidence in his status before God as a man. He knew his sin clearly, but equally clearly the mercy of God. Emphatically, he asserts, "In God is my salvation and my glory." Outwardly, David appears doomed, resembles a collapsing wall or a tottering fence, but David recognizes by faith that appearances are deceiving, and that in God he is a tower built upon a rock. Secure in a refuge which cannot be shaken, though David indeed has sinned and can be accused by men, he rests confidently in the known and proven mercies of the Almighty and Sovereign God. His earnest plea to his followers, therefore, is this: Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. It is easy to pour out our hearts to one whom we love and trust. If we fail to pour out our hearts to God, we reveal a lack of love and trust. God has no heart of stone, but rather a heart of love. He has an infinite and perfect capacity for understanding as well as aiding us. If we avoid prayer, it is because we are afraid He does understand us all too clearly, and we prefer to retain our hypocrisies. But when, like David, we come confessing our sin and receiving His mercy and grace, we pour out our hearts to Him gladly, and in distress gain confidence, knowing that our trust is in God, 
who is our salvation and our defence. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him 